Today on Blue 58, the 2023 NFL Draft is in the books. How did the Packers do on days two and three? And how does this year's class shape the overall roster? Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, and I am very happy to be with you here for another episode. Boy, that goes quick, doesn't it? All those weeks of preparation and talking about who the Packers might pick. What are they going to do? How does it all fit together? Will they trade up? Will they trade down? What are they going to do? And then in just a couple days, it's gone. Now we're left waiting until next year if you really need your draft fix. And if you really want to see how this is going to shape out or shake out for the Packers, we've got almost three months to go until training camp rolls around. But there's plenty to talk about. We're going to spend this episode talking about the guys themselves And over the next couple weeks, we're going to talk about how this all starts to fit together. But let's focus on the guys first and foremost. I think there was some panic going around certain circles of the Packers fandom after the Packers didn't pick a pass catcher in the first round. I think the NFL kind of agreed, and they showed us they agreed, that there really wasn't anybody worth taking at 13. There wasn't a tight end who deserved to go that high. And Jackson Smith and Jigba didn't go until much later. Much later. It might be a little bit strong, but it it was a while later. 13 seems like it probably would have been high for a guy that borderline really fits what the Packers are looking for. We did talk about the idea of the Packers making an exception to some of their rules as far as drafting receivers go, and they did that on day two. But before they made their exception, they picked up Luke Musgrave, the big tight end out of Oregon State, at pick number 42. Six feet five inches tall, nearly six foot six, 253 pounds, a relative athletic score of 9.78. Really pretty solid testing across the board. I love his athleticism. He seems like a pretty big projection to me. Not the most polished college tight end, but a legitimately great athlete. His 10 yard split really stands out right there with Lucas Van Ness, who is uber elite. He was a tier one prospect in our rankings, was productive, was productive on a per play basis. He was an insanely athletic and productive tight end, but I think that productivity has to come with a little bit of an asterisk. Because though his per-play productivity is great, it is a pretty small sample size. Just 47 career catches in 34 career games and two touchdowns among those 47 career catches compared with nine drops. And the reason that per-game productivity, or that overall productivity, I should say, though that 34-game total is so small, is that he missed 11 games his final year in college. So if you look ahead, as we will with every, every one of these prospects, to you know, just kind of some thoughts and some questions about them as a prospect, that is a big question. What's the deal with that injury? Is it fully behind him? Is it going to be a recurring sort of thing? Because if you're taking a guy with a knee injury right away, well... I guess it's going to be a little bit of a recurring issue with this draft class because there are quite a few guys who missed fairly significant time with various injuries. The Packers clearly don't think it's that big of a deal because they took him two or ten picks into the second round. So their medical staff is notoriously pretty cautious. If they're not overly concerned about it, I don't think we should be overly concerned about it as well. However, as with a lot of these things, it is a data point. He did miss those eleven games, and it. Did you know we didn't get a chance to see what he could do his final year really at Oregon State? The other big question I think, as far as Musgrave go, is what is his role really? Would guess he's probably the Robert Tunyon big slot type guy, because even if we don't make that big of a deal out of college blocking, his blocking was pretty bad for a tight end, a high end tight end prospect, and again blocking shouldn't be a big evaluation point for a college tight end in terms of the overall picture. But I think the right way to look at it is as a starting point, where are you right now? And I think that's a very real, for most tight ends coming out of college, it's, it's a, it's not a great starting point. You're not an elite blocker coming out of college because most of what you contribute to your team really isn't blocking, but tight ends are going to have to block in the NFL at some point. And if you're starting off from, you know, being relatively behind the eight ball as a blocker, that's going to be a problem as you try to project into the NFL. And his blocking was particularly bad among the tight ends that we looked at. His blocking grade from Pro Football Focus was the fifth worst among the tight ends 
in the in the selection that we looked at among the tight ends that appeared in the top 200 prospects on the consensus mock draft big board he was the fifth worst There's really just no way around that is is blocking grade for his final or not for his final year but his his last full season of college football 2021 was the fifth worst that we looked at it was it just was so if you look at that as a starting point he's got a ways to go as a blocker he's less of a polished prospect than some of these other guys you know michael mayer darnell washington even you know uh tucker craft it just is a fact of his evaluation that he is is not really that great as a blocker. But, you know, part of that is what you get asked to do in college, too. And it doesn't seem like that was really much of his game. Was, they just wanted him to be sort of a matchup problem. And it seems like he would he did that fairly effectively. So probably playing a little bit more in the slot than he did in college. Only about 18% of his snaps, his, his last significant college season, 2020, 2021, uh, were there. But you think you could project with the with the athleticism and, and skill set that he has to probably play outside a little bit more or at least detached from the formation a little bit more. So a good upside prospect there with the Packers' first pick on day two. Pick number two after a trade down was Jaden Reed, the wide receiver out of Michigan State. 5'10 and 7 eighths, just a hair under 5'11, 187 pounds. Relative athletic score, 6'7'4". Not great overall, but his straight line speed, pretty good, 4 4 5, 40, not, you know, the ultra top end guys. And he only did the three cone for, uh, for agility testing, 4 2 four, two, nine time, about average. His jumping number is just okay, too. Now, here is your tendency breaking wide receiver. He is the third shortest receiver the Packers have drafted since the year 2000. A little more than half an inch taller than Randall Cobb and significantly taller than Amari Rodgers, inch and a half, nearly two inches. But he broadly fits the profile of what we asked for. Good speed, though not a ultra burner like some of the other smaller guys in this draft class. He does have inside-outside versatility and was primarily actually an outside receiver at Michigan State. He's got some return ability. He's got some running ability. They did hand it to him from time to time. Seems to have a package of skills that is of use to the Packers here. The big question here, and I think this is going to be the question for Musgrave, for Reed and for Kraft, is why this guy? If the Packers were looking to break their tendencies, and I think looking at their pre-draft visits, that seems clear. They were looking at some smaller receivers throughout their pre-draft process. If they're looking to break tendencies, looking to get away from what they've done historically, why this guy and why not Jalen Hyatt? Why not Tyler Scott? Why not Marvin Mims? Why this guy? My suspicion is that they saw his punt return ability, and that may have been the deciding factor. And if that's the case, that certainly is a reason, which is better than some decisions that you see teams make. But I don't know if that's a good reason to pick somebody. Special teams ability is going to be a secondary skill set at most. What you really want is a guy who's going to produce as a receiver. And I think there is reason to believe that Reed can do that. But as a matter of fact, he was not as productive in college as some of the guys the Packers took him ahead of. And I think that is something worth monitoring long term. Still, I think it's a guy who's probably going to play in the slot, who's going to spell Romeo Dobbs on the outside. You can certainly see how it would fit. I just don't know if the alternatives you know, would necessarily have been worse. And if you're picking a guy because of what he can do as a punt returner in the second round, he better be a pretty good punt returner, I would think. The Packers' third and final pick on day two was Tucker Kraft, the big tight end out of North Dakota, South Dakota State. Sorry, Bison fans, don't get mad at me there. South Dakota State's. South Dakota State's Tucker Kraft. Just a fuzz over 6'4 and a half, nearly 6'5, not quite. Uh, but 254 pounds, 968 relative athletic score, ran the 40 yard dash in 4.69 seconds. Pretty good for a guy his size. While disappointing to me personally to not get Darnell Washington, between Kraft and Musgrave, I would say the pairing is a pretty nice consolation prize. And getting two tight ends, I'm never going to complain about that. I think Kraft pairs really well with Musgrave, and I think it's never a bad idea to hedge your bets, especially if you're adding two athletes to a position group that was pretty much just one athlete. It was pretty much Robert Tunyon post-ACL surgery in 2022, so... 
It's not a very athletic tight end room. If you start thinking about Mercedes Lewis and what he does, and Josiah DeGuara really not contributing much, though an elite athlete um, for what he does, not really getting down the field all that much. Between Kraft and Musgrave, you've got guys that can at least move here. And I would guess that Kraft probably ends up playing more the hand-down, wide tight end role than Musgrave does. Though their snap splits in college were almost identical. Both of them played 17-18% of their snaps in the slot. Kraft actually graded out better as a blocker. We did wonder in our tight end preview why he wasn't a little more dominant as a, a, a well, a guy who got significant interest from Alabama as a potential transfer target. Why wasn't he more dominant as a blocker at the level of college football at which he played? But to be fair, that is once again not the biggest deal. It's a starting point. And as far as starting points go, I think you could do worse than what Kraft did in college. Big question is how he's going to project from South Dakota State to the NFL. Can the Packers strike small school gold two years in a row? A guy with this kind of athletic profile seems like the guy to, sort of guy who could do this. But again, you kind of have the same question with Kraft that you do with Reed. Why Kraft and, and not Darnell Washington? I mean, taking my personal interest in Washington aside, what did the Packers specifically like about Kraft versus Washington? Was the character stuff with Washington that we saw floating around, um, you know, late in the pre-draft process, maybe a little bit more real than we thought? Uh, maybe people are a little bit more concerned about his knee injury uh, than than we thought. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe the Packers, you know, got him in and took a look at the knee and says, absolutely no, not no way. We're not going to do that. We're not going there. It's it's a possibility. We have to at least consider it. Uh, they go with the guy with the cleaner medicals. Maybe the a guy who's upside they like a little bit more as a receiver. But it does seem like both Kraft and Musgrave are kind of projects. And I think, to be fair, we need to remember that most tight ends coming into the NFL are going to be projects. 2023 is probably not going to be the Musgrave and Kraft show. They're going to take some time here. Fortunately, just looking at the tight end room, there should be plenty of snaps there as they try to figure out what they are as NFL players transitioning from college football into the NFL. There's going to be a learning curve there, and it looks like just as a guess, they're probably going to have quite a few snaps available from which to learn. So that's day two. Day three, the Packers are really, really busy. And honestly, from a podcaster perspective, from a guy who's not making these picks, from a guy who's not like a hardcore draft Nick, I'd say day three is mostly about vibes. Honestly, we, we got to be real here. For every Aaron Jones that you find on day three, there are, are a lot more guys that don't even do a fraction of that. You're probably about even for every Aaron Jones you find as guys who don't even make it to their first like regular season in the NFL with the team that drafted them. If that, there's probably more of the second than the first. So I think you're going almost entirely for upside here. You're not looking for instant contributors because they're just not going to be there. It's They're few and far between. So looking for big upside picks. And I think, by and large, the Packers did pretty well there. But there are a couple head scratchers in this group, even in you know conceding the fact that most of these guys were not looking for even short-term contributors here. We're just looking for hope, or, or hope, looking for you know a lottery ticket. Make maybe a more contemporary example or, or younger audience example, looking for loot boxes, something like that. The Packers got a couple shots at some high-end loot here uh, to continue continue the video game analogy, starting with. Pick number 116, Colby Wooden, the defensive end out of Auburn. Six foot three, 207, uh, six foot four, excuse me, 273 pounds, a 924 relative athletic score, really solid profile across the board. He didn't bench well, he didn't do the vertical, but literally every other number is elite. He sure is an athlete, but I have no idea what he is in terms of where you play him. We had him as a tier two defensive line prospect. I put him as a defensive lineman. Pro Football Focus thinks he's an edge. Other people think he's an edge. Other people think he needs to play tackle. Packers think they want him inside. As a defensive lineman, he hit on our production ratio threshold of one sack or tackle per loss per game for his career, but not on the pressure rate. We need to get you to 10% uh, in terms of you know pressures per snap or pressure snap. He didn't get there. But he does have an interesting kind of college player profile. In terms of where he lined up on defense, it's similar to Lucas Van Ness. He played a lot inside. In fact, he played mostly defensive tackle, a lot of three and four technique 
uh, type stuff did bump out to edge occasionally. Um, compared to Van Ness, he was who was more like a cameo player inside. Wooden's kind of the inverse. He played a lot inside and then occasionally would rush as a, a an outside pass rusher too. He had nearly 250 snaps as a defensive tackle in 2022, uh, m- more than he played on the edge. Uh, he played inside more than the than the outside. So the question that I have really doesn't apply to to Wooden so much as the Packers defense as a whole because they've got a, a few of these guys now. How are you going to use them? Guys that are kind of tweener, edge, interior guys that doesn't seem to really dovetail with what the Packers need in terms of wanting to beef up to stop the run, which was a huge problem for them last year and historically has been a big problem for them. Uh, Really under Joe Barry, it's been a a big problem. So how does this dovetail with that problem? Maybe they're not trying to solve that problem specifically, just trying to make the defense overall better. I think that's a fair approach. I don't know if it's the best approach because they really haven't tried to add any other kind of bodies, but Wooden at least gives them another athletic guy to move around on the defensive front. The next pick is the real head scratcher. Pick number 149, Sean Clifford, the quarterback out of Penn State, 6'2", 218 pounds, an overall athletic score of 9.04. He was at Penn State for a whopping six years, including a redshirt year. Seems very much like just a guy. He may have peaked as a quarterback in high school, which is more than I can say. I don't know if I ever really peaked athletically, um, at least not in really a way that anybody would care about outside my family and the, the guys that I played basketball with in high school. Uh, but it, he looks like a guy that if you need him to do much more than keep the seat warm, that would be a problem for your team. I don't understand this pick. The Packers really only justification here as well. We needed a backup quarterback. Sure. That's probably true. But it seems like you probably could have gotten Clifford later, and it seems like you probably could have picked just any guy with a more projectable NFL skill set than Clifford does. Because Clifford's big deal is that he's athletic, and he ran an RPO offense pretty well at Penn State. Well, athleticism is a nice-to-have thing as your quarterback. You'd certainly rather have an athlete than a guy who's not athletic at all, but it's not something you can really build your game around if you have nothing else. Even, Even guys that are runners in the NFL. So you think about your quarterbacks who are good at running. Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, expanded out to Josh Allen, uh, Kyler Murray. All of those guys are all, are also good at throwing. You can't just say, well, I'm a good athlete and I can execute simple RPO stuff. That's great. You got to actually be able to throw at some point. And all of those guys can hurt you with your arm too. And it doesn't look like Clifford really has uh, the skills or ability to do that. So the big question for me, other than why the Packers took him, is why guys like Clifford don't consider switching positions a little bit more. Now, you probably do make more money as a backup quarterback in the NFL if you can find a place and hang on for a decade, sure. But I wonder if you have a better shot at just making it to the NFL at all if you tried to do some other backfield-esque type stuff. Now, clearly Clifford is a pretty good athlete. He moves pretty well. Could he gain... 20 pounds and be an H-back tight end type guy. He's maybe a little bit short for that, but should guys consider doing stuff like that? You you don't even have to look much farther than Penn State. Michael Robinson, the the Penn State quarterback, it's a long time ago now, more than 10 years, but he was a, he was a great quarterback at Penn State, but did not have the sort of passing ability to make it in the NFL. So he switches to fullback and has a long and productive NFL career with the Seahawks. I wonder if that kind of thing should be an option or should be a consideration for more guys. Just prove that you're willing to do whatever. Shoot, Danny Etling on the Packers has switched back and forth from receiver just to try to make it in the NFL. I don't know if Clifford has that kind of athleticism, but maybe more guys should be considering stuff like that. Continuing on, 10 picks later, the Packers add Dontavion Wicks, a wide receiver out of Virginia, 6'1", 206 pounds. We mentioned him in our wide receiver preview as a guy who's kind of got an athletic profile that is just all over the map. An overall 9-1-1-7 relative athletic score. Good size. The weight in, in particular is good for what the Packers are looking for. Good jumping numbers. Bad 40-yard dash overall, like 4-6 range. Did get it down into the high 4-5s at his pro day apparently, but he is elite coming off the line. His first 10 yards, very, very good. Overall, this looks like a classic Brian Gutekunst wide receiver. He's not worried about the top end speed, but you've got pretty good movement 
abilities. You've got good size and overall just a traits pick. The overall speed, again, is not great, but I think that traits package is interesting. And I think he probably would have gone higher than this if his productivity hadn't tanked in his final year. Now, he had something like 57 catches for I, I don't know how many yards, but he averaged more than 20 yards per catch. And I think it was over 21 yards per catch uh, in 2021, his second to last season of college football. But then they make some coaching changes, some scheme changes heading into his final year, and things tail off in a big way for Wicks. So who's the real guy? Is he 2021 Dontavion Wicks or is he 2022 Dontavion Wicks? Because you'd think if you are an elite or even very good wide receiver prospect, some of that should still shine through productivity-wise in even a suboptimal offense. It doesn't look like that was really how things ended up. But on the 2021 numbers, things looked a lot better. Second question is, where does he play? He's primarily an outside guy in college. I would guess he's kind of another Romeo Dobbs. Packers like him on the outside. You're probably not moving him inside, especially if you have Jaden Reed around. So maybe he's a guy who just spells spells Dobbs now and then. Um, another traits upside sort of guy. Definitely not a high-end burner, but he fits what the Packers have done previously at the receiver position. 20 picks later, the Packers add Carl Brooks, a defensive end at a Bowling Green with pick number 179, 6'3", 303 pounds, 588 relative athletic score. People thought he was going to tear it up at his pro day. He did not, though apparently he got sick shortly before his pro day, so I have to think that may have affected his pro day just a little bit. Probably my day, favorite day three pick here. I think there's a chance he's going to be really interesting because he had a long and very productive career at Bowling Green. Now, One of the things we mentioned when we talk about Lucas Van Ness is that, yes, his productivity numbers, the numbers we look at, production ratio uh, and pressure rate, they were very good, but they were not – they may have been a little bit inflated by the fact that he only played 26 career college games and he only had 497 pass rush snaps or something like that. Brooks is very much not the case there. He – was productive, and he played in a ton of games. He had a career production ratio of over 1.5 and a career pressure rate of more than 13%. In fact, nearly 14% despite playing 49 career games. He had more than 1,100 pass rushing snaps, and he still kept getting to the quarterback game after game after game, play after play after play. That's bananas. That's really, really unusual. The question here is, can he manage the change to the defensive line? Because he really played an unusual sort of role at Bowling Green, very much an outside sort of pass rusher. I don't know exactly how you transition a guy that is rushing the passer from a two-point stance at 300-plus pounds in college to the defensive line in the NFL, because it seems like the exact sort of like the exact inverse problem that the Packers had with Rashawn Gary, or the exact inverse question we should say they had with Rashawn Gary, because he played, you know, mid 270s, close to 280 in college, and often was an interior sort of player in 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 college. But the Packers wanted him at on the edge, so loses a little bit of weight, plays on the outside, and because he's such a great athlete, you know, things tended to work out. Brooks was a bigger guy in college, and may have tried to slim down a little bit for combine purposes, but he still played an outside edge rushing role at about 300 pounds. How do you move that guy inside when that's what he was doing so well at the college level? But I I don't have the answer to that question. I don't know how serious of a question it is for the Packers. Maybe they're just going to say, hey, just line up here, be in a three-point stance and, and go when they snap the ball. Maybe it's that simple. But in any case, I would encourage you to go watch his highlights because they're just a lot of fun. He's a big, kind of roundish guy rushing from a two-point stance, and he he does seem to have some athleticism on tape. He seems to move really well, but it's just a fun guy to watch uh, in in the highlights. It's it's a really really cool thing. Anders Carlson at pick number two hundred seven is next up for the Packers. A kicker out of Auburn, six five, two hundred nineteen pounds. Real quick on this guy, uh, Dane Brugler rated twenty kickers in the beast. He's the tallest, uh, was one of the five best. I don't want to really split hairs on this one too much. The Packers are going to need a kicker because it seems like we are into the post-Crosby era. And although Brian Gutekunst is not officially closing the door, it's nearly entirely closed. And you might as well get a kicker at some point. So if you think of Carlson as your guy, 
roll the dice. You got a million day three picks anyway. You might as well take a look at a few. The big question here is how much his college performance matters. Because he attempted a lot of long-range kicks in college, which is probably an overall good thing because it means you've got the leg to do it, but he didn't make a whole ton of them. Because accuracy at length matters in terms of evaluating college kickers. He wasn't very accurate at length. Justice Mosqueda of Acme Packing Company uh, does a great look at kickers every year, and he, he brought up some of his metrics on Carlson after the pick, uh, talking about how, and I, I won't pull all of his numbers here just because I want you to go read the piece. He explains it much better than I will here that, you know, adjusting kicker's accuracy for length is an important way to evaluate kickers in college because everybody should be able to make those gimme kicks. Everything under 40 yards, you should be handling that in college. Uh, things can be a little bit different in college because of how wide the hash marks are. But overall, you should be making the gimme kicks. Carlson seems to have done that. But his overall accuracy goes down a little bit because he's, he wasn't converting from length. There are some extenuating factors, though, and I do want to mention at least one thing that Justice here Justice says about that here. So quoting now from his piece, quote, The narrative around Carlson's career is that he has not played a healthy season since he was named a second-team All-American in 2020. In 2021, he tore his ACL in his left non-kicking leg. In 2022, he wore a brace on that leg and only at the combine began to kick without it when he was finally able to show NFL teams that he has made strides in his recovery. Carlson also fractured his shoulder in November of 2022, ending his final year of college ball prematurely, end quote. Now that's a lot of moving parts for a kicker that you're drafting. A previous knee injury that may have affected his performance for not just one, but two years, you know, wiping out his entire 2021 season. Now, there is some good stuff in in his past, but we're a couple years removed from that now. How far or how long of a leash do you give a guy on recovery before you just say he's just not that guy anymore? Uh, I guess we'll find out this summer, and uh, we'll see if he can can round into form here. This does seem like a Rich Bisaccia kick, or pick, excuse me. Uh, He does have some connections to Carlson's older brother, Daniel, uh, from their time together at the Raiders, with the Raiders. So maybe Bisaccia knows something that we don't. And I would think in terms of special teams uh, evaluation, there is a very good chance that Rich Bisaccia knows something that I don't. Continuing on, the Packers picked Carrington Valentine, a quarterback out of Kentucky at pick number 232, 5'11", 193 pounds, 9'3", relative athletic score. He profiles as a special teamer because he can run fast in a straight line with a 4 40-yard dash. Just okay on the three-cone, and that is the only agility drill that he did. This guy's a special teamer. He played kickoff coverage, punt coverage, punt return in 2022 at the college level. You're really only asking if he can do anything on on defense at all, but he's going to be covering stuff. That's going to be his ticket to the roster, and it seems like he has already done some of that in college. Lou Nichols the second, a running back out of Central Michigan, was the pick for the Packers at number 235. Five feet, 10 inches tall, 220 pounds, did not test due to a hamstring injury. Interesting prospect. You look at him play, and to me, he resembles kind of the midway point between Eddie Lacy and Dewan Harris. Big but not heavy looking, moves pretty well, seems to have some agility. He'd have done really well in our running back metrics if he had tested. He had 71 catches in 32 career games, scored a bunch of touchdowns, was very productive at Central Michigan. However, he was also banged up a little bit his final year at Central Michigan, so you're wondering, I think, a little bit how much injuries affect him, how much we would have uh, evaluated him differently had he been able to run uh, at either the Combine or the Pro Day. He just, we don't have a lot to go on him other than box score sort of stuff and highlights on YouTube. Um, But a 5'10", 220-pound running back who can move and catch the ball, that's checking quite a few boxes already. It seems they're adding an interesting prospect to the mix here at running back. Pick number 242, the Packers finally addressed their defensive backfield, adding Anthony Johnson, a safety out of Iowa State. 5'11 and a half, 205 pounds. Pretty good athlete overall. 8-1-3 relative athletic score, 4-5-4, 40-yard dash. Good explosion numbers, good leaper. But he's another box slot type of guy. Most of his snaps his final year in college came either in the box or in the slot. Played fewer, I think, than 75 snaps as a deep safety. I really wish the Packers had been able to add some kind of deep safety option, but at least he is nominally a safety, and at least he seems to have been pretty good at what he did do playing in the slot and playing in the box. The question would be, could he do more schematically in the NFL than he did in college? 
because the Packers do need that deep safety help. He is another not deep safety, putting it that way. The Packers have a bunch of guys who want to play in the slot or do special team stuff. Johnson appears to be another one of those. Can they do anything to shore up the, the deep back end of their defense? At least as far as the draft goes, they really didn't go that direction. Finally, the Packers finish thing off fin- finish things off with the only day three pick that I got right in my mock draft. Grant Dubose, the wide receiver out of Charlotte, 6'2", 201 pounds, 879 relative athletics, or 457 in the 40, and another elite 10-yard split, much like Davion Wicks. Also an elite broad jumper here. I think this is probably another special teamer. He has punt coverage experience, and I think you're wondering, if you're asking questions about his role on the roster, whether or not there's some kind of threat to Samori Ture here. He's not much of a special teams guy. He's definitely not as big as Dubose, though it's pretty close. Uh, maybe a little bit faster, I would think. But if Dubose is covering punts and Ture is not, I think that's a leg up for Dubose, and I think there's going to be some competition on special teams towards the bottom end of the Packers' wide receiver depth chart. So that is the 2023 draft class. A couple overall thoughts and a couple of questions here. Overall, I think this, again, feels like an upside class. I don't know really if there's a guy in this group outside of Lucas Van Ness where you look at him and say, here's exactly what he's going to do in 2023, and here's exactly what his role is going to look like. You could probably say that about Mr. Carlson, the new kicker. He's probably going to kick in 2023. But other than that, we're still figuring out how these guys fit together with what the Packers already have on their roster. What are Musgrave and Kraft going to do together at tight end? How do the Packers use Colby Wooden and Lucas Van Ness together, if at all, among their other edge rushers and defensive linemen? We just don't know a lot of those things. So the Packers are betting on a lot of upside here. And in a year that you're kind of looking at as a potential rebuilding year, that may not be that bad of an idea. You just add a bunch of athletic prospects. And then in 2024, you really start building into something. That's one way of looking at it, I guess. There is, however, we should say, a lot of upside here. Athleticism, for sure. That's always something that's nice to have. But there's a lot of versatility in this class, too. You you talk about Van Ness. You talk about Wooden. There are guys that can play, you know, inside and outside. Kraft and Musgrave can both play a lot of different stuff uh, as far as their their tight end roles. Uh, Jaden Reed, you know, he didn't do a lot of of outside-inside stuff in terms of uh, where he played at, at receiver in college. But he does offer some punt return ability. And you can kind of go down the list and say a lot of similar things about a lot of the guys in this draft class. They can do some different things. And I think that only adds to the potential upside there. Sure, there are some head scratchers. And I think you see a lot of Rich Bisaccia influence here. The Packers went from signing for special teams last spring to drafting for special teams this spring. Almost everybody on day three has some kind of special teams experience, significant special teams experience looking for guys that covered a lot of punts and kicks and were on punt return in college. Maybe you're looking for just those roles specifically. I don't know. Uh, But if you know that you want to get those guys to shore up those units, maybe drafting for them isn't that bad of an idea. I think overall, there's a chance that this class could feel kind of disappointing for 2023. You're looking at at guys that are works in progress. Even Lucas Van Ness is still figuring things out as an edge rusher, and even he is going to have some role questions in 2023. But I think that's okay. These picks don't have to work out in year one to be good picks. They just have to work out long term. And there's a lot of that going around with Brian Gutekunst in terms of his pick situations. Uh, We talk about Jordan Love as kind of the epitome of that. You know, We haven't gotten anything out of Love his first three years at all. But if it works out, as we've said since the very very beginning, if it works out, Brian Gutekunst is a genius. If it doesn't, well, it's another kind of just example of kind of that the half snake oil salesman GM. Everybody's just saying like, "Look, I can fix this team. I just just need to get my guys, and as soon as I get the right guys, it'll be perfect." And you just wait and see. All these guys have upside, and you know that's not a unique criticism of Brian Gutekunst that's everybody who is a GM in the NFL they all think they've got the answers they all think they've got the guys that have that have upside long term and i think if they're they're honest with themselves they know in their heart that most of these guys aren't going to work out but the packers at least are betting on some guys that haven't reached their ceiling yet i think that's clear with everybody they've picked they're not they're not at their ceiling with the possible expl- uh, exception of Sean Clifford 
They, they haven't maxed out what they can do yet, which is good. It just might lead you into a situation in 2023 where as a fan, you're looking at all these guys the Packers drafted. What did it end up being like 13 picks or something like that? And you're saying, this is what we got from this class? Not as big of an impact as I hope. They should have been better. But I think we're going to have to give this one time. I mean, every draft class is going to need time, but this class in particular, I think is going to need a little bit of time to round into shape. We're probably looking at 2024 or 2025 before some of these things really start to come together. But if you've got super duper athletes like Van Ness, like Musgrave, like Kraft, and it does come together, the, the ceiling is very, very high. But if it doesn't, you're, you're probably missing pretty bad on, you know, their three of your first four picks. And then in the second round with Reed, you also made another exception to your, you know, typical wide receiver archetype. There are opportunities for this to go very, very bad too. So I don't want to get too high or too low on this class right now. I think short term, again, it, it may be a little bit frustrating, but at the very least, I think we can say it has upside. I think it's worth monitoring the guys the Packers selected versus the guys that seem similar that they didn't, but that's going to be the case with every draft class. And we'll take a look at back at that, I'm sure, in a couple of years and see where the Packers ended up uh, relative to where some of those other guys went. In the meantime, that's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I hope you enjoyed this show. I hope you, if you did enjoy it, that you would share it with someone you think would enjoy it too. It's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.